for our last speaker for the evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to you. Um, T is a true leader in the field of organic land management. Those of us that you know do it at the practitioner level, you know, look up to him as somebody that has taken both small and extremely large landscapes and proven the concept. So the idea that you know organic can't work, it can't replace chemistries. T has shown that it clearly can and has many successful uh, things. So personally, I'd like to say thank you for that. T as leading leading us all. Uh, Eric T. Fleischer. Principal Organic Landscape Program Developer, Developer of F2 Environmental Design in Pottersville, New Jersey. T is a national leader in the field of sustainable horticulture and was the former director of horticulture at Battery Park, City Parks Conservancy in Lower Manhattan. T brought this 37-acre oasis of parkland on the Hudson River to the forefront as the only public garden space in New York City to be maintained completely organically. A 2008 Loeb Fellow at Harvard University, T is a frequent lecturer on sustainable practices and serves as a consultant for some of the top institutions in the country. T. Thank you very much, Chip. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I would say yes. Uh, boy, that seems like a long time ago. But it's only been three years since I uh, retired from my position at Battery Park City. Um, but certainly we'll utilize that along with a number of other components in terms of projects that we've done in the same manner since then. And uh, it's, uh, we're just getting the electronics going. It was great to uh, hear Joan's presentation. And uh, without this technology, um, but we're covering a lot of material tonight, and um, so uh, hopefully this will give a good sense, and we can get it going properly. Um, and um, <clears throat> but uh, it's been a really interesting run, and the whole thing that I want to say more than anything is yes, we all want to stop the utilization of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. In order to do so successfully, we need to learn how the systems function. And we need to give a, another option as to making these uh, practices work. And so, uh, very interesting, uh, Peter, old friend of mine, and um, Actually, the title of this presentation came up for when Peter asked me to lecture for one of his classes at the GSD on restoring ecologically disturbed sites. And at that time, it really made me think that every landscape that we visit in an urban and suburban environment, and many rural environments, is an environmentally disturbed site because it's not functioning the way it should. So I tonight have a number of different um, uh, projects that I'm going to present to you and show you that, in fact, this is possible. And of course, it brings to mind many different elements. A lot of people have brought to, uh, to mind you know, the cost difference. Well, we can talk about that. But first, let's get through. Uh, some of the basics of this practice. So I'm going to bring to you the element of <clears throat> these projects that really are in the most difficult situations of urban horticulture, let's say the underbelly of urban horticulture. Um, I started this project at Battery Park City in 1989 when Tessa Huxley, uh, the executive director at that time, brought me on. And part of the, our negotiation was, I said, well, I would like to manage a high-profile public park completely organically. And she was absolutely on board with that and supported me the whole time. If you don't have that buy-in, 
It needs to be from the top down. And she supported every element of that and lived it with me. We're really partners in this, uh, in terms of making this happen. And so Battery Park City, uh, as you can see here, is a 92 acre. I'll start with this project since it's where this all really sort of began. Um, is this little island that was built on landfill. Uh, initially a Nelson Rockefeller brainchild when um, they figured that they wanted to own a part of the city, but it wasn't really, uh, they had to build a new portion of it. So they built it up on landfill. And so this is city mapped, but state run. And it has a number of different gardens, like this perennial garden by Lyndon Miller, this more native uh, upstate New York type garden by Michael Van Valkenburg, and heavily utilized gardens. The biggest issue we have is compaction and utilization. So if things can work under these conditions, let's just say 10,000 Santas descending upon you at the last moment, imagine what this does to your soil. So you're dealing with this kind of thing. We had a lot of things. It seems like everything happened in this little spot. So 9-11, we dealt with the cleanup of that. Uh, and all through organic means of soil management. We had a, land, a plane that went down in the Hudson River. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But that plane ended up our, under our esplanade. And what do we, they, they tie it off to? Minissa Selvatica, right? <laughs> not to, the, not to the, you know, the fence or anything like that, but to the tree, because that was the most stable uh, thing to tie it off to. Um, we dealt with this. Uh, Joan brought up salt situations. So, of course, with the rising waters, uh, this was something I presented to the ASLA in 2014, but post-Sandy implications. Salt water coming in, which we're going to deal with more and more. Uh, these were the uh, salt uh, way beyond the decisiemens of salt um, that were, uh, you know, that plants would live under during that requirement. This was two weeks afterwards because the soils were so sandy that we were able to leach them. So it's something we have to take into consideration, the textual gradation of soils and how, um, how can landscapes respond after this kind of an event. So what we did find was that the soils that were less draining uh, did not uh, come back as well. So, to see here, these are London plane trees that did perfectly well in that esplanade that you just saw underwater, whereas in other areas where they, we did not have as well a draining soil, they all uh, died. Along the FDR Drive, you'll see many of them who are, that have not survived. Does anyone know who this person is? Anyone? Chip? <laughs> it's Fritz Haber. This is a gentleman that we owe a lot of our issues to. This is the person who figured out how to synthesize nitrogen in 1903. And since that time, we've had tremendous amounts of use of nitrogen. And this is what we are dealing with now in terms of responding to those components that have brought this element, uh, our, our landscape down, and have compromised the natural functioning systems of our landscapes. So organic, okay, we call it organic, but let's call it best practices or sustainable land management or responsible land stewardship. So soil management, composting, plant selection and placement, pest and disease control responsibly, irrigation management as little as possible, proper planting techniques and proper pruning techniques. Now, it's very interesting because Peter's and my work very much mirror each other in which he's talking about the plants, the same thing is happening with the soils, and we've talked about that a lot. The soils are becoming more acid, more bacterial. And so we're seeing these changes, and it's both affecting each other. So the first thing I always look at is soil structure. This is early on, and you can see when Battery Park City was being built. Same 
map you saw before. And at this point, early when I became involved, I took samples of what the parent material was in these spots. And from that, uh, this was clean fill, but this is how I pretty much approach every project. As I look, what is that subsoil? I call that the parent material. Then I build a base component, which marries the, base, the parent material with then the lower root zone and the upper root zone. And the same material goes through the entire soil, pro soil profile. So we don't have any interface layers. So you have to build the right home for these microorganisms, these critters that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of days. I hope you'll come and look under the microscope with me tomorrow for the class that I'm giving for that. But what are the benefits of restoring and maintaining a balanced soil biology? What does this do for us? Well, this is a leaf, a corn leaf, on a healthy soil. And we can see the saprophytic fungi, the bacteria, all this that's breaking down this foliar matter into a system that is working in the soil. This is a healthy soil that will break this down. If it's dead and it's been filled with nitrogen, well, all those organisms are gone. This is what breaks this down. Now this, oh, it's lovely. Let's see here. Now this is a compost tea with a bacterial feeding nematode. We've got ciliates, we've got flagellates. This is what you wanna see in a healthy soil. It's living. This is what we see under our feet if we look under a microscope. Isn't this amazing? Can you imagine this happening? It's romantic, isn't it? Living, dying, making love in the soil. I know everybody's had dinner and everybody's getting tired. I'm trying to wake you up, All right? So look at this. This is not an instrument of torture. This is a bacterial feeding nematode. Isn't this amazing, a whale underneath the soil feeding on these bacteria and producing NH4? This is a fungi which feeds on root feeding nematodes. We have this, we found this at Harvard Yard. And this is what you find in a healthy, diverse soil, are these organisms that protect the plant. If we have this in the soil, this is what we need to do, in fact, to stop utilizing the pesticides and the fungicides and all that that we want to stop doing. Well, we need to provide this natural group of organisms into the soil. We need to understand how these systems work in order to make this function properly. So this, here we go. Here is a ciliate. This feeds on anaerobic bacteria. So this will take an anaerobic soil and turn it around. Look at this. This is like the Olympics of protozoans, isn't it? Isn't this amazing? So, this is what we look at. Now, you probably are all thinking right now, T has way too much time on his hands to be looking at this, all this stuff. But, you know, this is what really blows my hair back, and I don't have any hair. So, but you have to understand the beauty of this. This is what makes it function. So, in this sense, we have a soil that has organic matter, and we have a soil that doesn't. It's not really the organic matter, but it's the group of organisms that live in that organic matter. And there's a difference in compost. There's good compost, and there's compost that looks good, but it doesn't have the microbial activity in it that we should have. So when you're building a compost, you have certain recipes that work, and you can find this. We have this on the Harvard website. The Harvard FMO website, we have these recipes. But generally, I would say, you would go with a fungal mix because usually we are miss lacking in the fungal components. And that generally also brings the protozoans. So you don't have to write this down, you take a picture, but you will find this on the Harvard website as well. How you deal with your composting feedstocks is very important. So we dealt with the entire Battery Park City with about a 2,000 square foot footprint. So dealing with 36 acres of parkland in this footprint, 
was very workable. We, in fact, lost that space and ended up having to deal with in-vessel composting. But here we are dealing with those compost components and utilizing it. This is the in-vessel unit, which we ended up having to utilize at the end of the day, uh, which we just kept feeding. And it really developed our recipes to the point where we needed to do so. And in doing so, we cured them in these bonar bins, which we could then lift up and move to wherever we needed to for the right biology at the right place. So I've taken that a step further now in my life after Battery Park City, that if I do need something that is specific and we can't provide that in the area where we're working, I'll ship a bonar bin to that site with the characteristics we need to inoculate that soil the way it needs to be inoculated. So this, the whole thing is that everybody doesn't really want to look at the composting facility. Now, a great difference is this. This is Kew Gardens in England, in London. And when you visit Kew Gardens, there are signs all over the garden that say compost heap and an arrow. It brings you to the compost heap. You find this beautiful space where they're doing wind rowing. You've got a platform in which you can climb and look at it. And signage, which tells you about how it's all functioning. Now, I bring this up because this is what we have to be aware of. This is what we're working with. We can all say, Stop using pesticides. Stop using them. Well, yes, but we also have to understand how do we make these things function and appreciate it because it's a philosophical change we have to make. And this is how we bring our clients, our institutions into this to understand this component. So if we look at analysis here, of a compost, here's a compost, and we see, do you see this little thing where it says nutrient availability? 50 to 75 pounds. That's from the microbial activity, the number of bacteria we have to the protozoans, the predators. Now, here's another one. Now take a look at this. We have 300, and, I can't really read it, but over 300 pounds of available nitrogen because of the bacteria and our predators. So we're bringing, that's what we want to utilize to bring our soils back. We have to have an understanding of the materials that we're utilizing. It's not just about being labeled organic. We have to understand what's going into this to really make it function properly. So in doing that, compost tea brewing, that's something that has been you know, I like to call it liquid biological amendments because we engineer these things to build the biology that needs to function. And it's basically applying a very high quality compost with the characteristics you need with the foods that are required to build the, the final product that is required to bring that landscape back. It can be very functional in terms of lawn usage because you want to bring the biology there. You don't necessarily want to bring biological, uh, more organic matter. You just need the nutrient cycling capacity. Now, this is an interesting thing. This is a project where there was an ice skating rink set up on this ball field for the whole winter. And it was put in on March 21st. We knew it was coming in. We also knew that we would have to have this field open for Little League on April 5th, all right? Now, we brewed a liquid biological amendment for five days, put in certain things. It was specifically engineered. This is the day it was applied. This is the day after. Now, you would not achieve this in a regular soil, but the fact that turf was brought in and you have this very thin layer of soil and all the roots are within that layer, 
This woke it up, got that going in a way that nitrogen fertilizers could never do. Because you're dealing with the microbes that are doing this, not the fertilizer. The fertilizer is within the microbes, and you're getting the roots to go into that soil. So within that, obviously, we're looking at practices, depth of planting. These are issues we're always dealing with. Baskets, you all understand this. I know I'm probably getting into stuff you guys don't want to hear about. I'm telling you more about penguins than you want to know. I'm not sure, but these are the things when if you think a basket won't cause harm, take a look at that. And I think you guys all deal with this, and you deal with it in cities, whatever. This, we have to be aware of these issues. Soil volume. This is a continuous bed, but it's only a five-foot wide bed. This is a 30-foot wide bed. And look at the difference. These two tilia tomentosa were planted at the same time. So soil volume, we have to keep this in mind. These are the natural systems and how they work. We have to be aware of that. Our, our friends, this is the flagship of you know, beneficial predators. Uh, we should understand this. We should understand all its different components and how its different stages. So that when we go in, if somebody's thinking they're going to spray something, even if it's oil, you don't want to do that because if you've got these guys, that'll be cleaned up in two weeks. This lacewing, feeding on gypsy moth larvae. We need to understand what do these predators look like. We need to educate ourselves so that when we're looking at our landscape, not only from the perspective of this, but also picking up that soil, smelling it. We can find so much. We teach a class on just what do you do on site observation. You can pick up that soil, look at it, and figure so much out. And then also a microscope. You know, you can get a microscope fairly cheaply these days, cheaper than your iPhone. And then you can use your iPhone to take a picture of it. And then you can send it to someone like me and say, what do you think this is? You, you look at this and you can utilize this technology and we can share the information. But we need to understand how these systems function. So within that, we're trying not to live on an island and we want to export these best practices. And I'll bring this now. We're moving to Harvard. We started this and Peter was on this team. Uh, and uh, part of the group that talked Harvard into doing this, which was quite the project. Took my whole lobe year to try to talk them into it. Peter was very helpful, by the way. And uh, you know, they said, well, at the end of the day, what do you think? Uh, if it doesn't really work before graduation, can we roll out the green stuff? But you know, we went through this, did a one acre plot uh, off of Massachusetts Avenue. And we did the same stuff, how, you know, you look at What's the infiltration rate? All the functions of how soils work. What was the original soil depth? What was the root depth within the soil? We took that. And there's Peter, right there. We're looking at, we're having a tea party here. It's a whole, you know, tea party. And uh, we incorporated top dressing of compost. And here we go. This is, again, the original core. This was the control plot, which as you can see, we haven't gotten much more root growth. And this was the test plot, using no nitrogen, only incorporating, invigorating the biology that was there. And here we have eight inches of root growth. We broke through that compaction layer. This is what helps us save water. This helps us with all those components we're talking about, which it was required for us to stop utilizing those pesticides, those herbicides, those fungicides. And so this became very, you know, here there's Drew Faust saying, yeah, you know, this, this looks much better. And so now we are doing, you know, the campus, 85 acres of the campus, we're doing completely organically and uh, through composting. And what was really great was this student, uh, Benjamin Wolf, who got involved with it and did DNA extractions. And we learned a lot more in terms of the trending of how the soils worked between uh, saprophytic fungi and the metabolizing fungi in the landscape. It was excellent. It was just a wonderful project all around. And everybody went out. And 
we put these signs out, everybody's welcome to the landscape, nobody has to worry. And so Rose F. Kennedy Greenway, another one. I'm just giving you examples. This is another issue on opening day. We had issues with the boxwood. There was no nutrient cycling capacity happening. We got involved. We started doing biological infusions. We didn't think we'd be able to bring that hedge back, but we were able to do so. The turf condition was similar, 1.5 inch of thatch, three inches of soil. This is three months later. Now, if you have roots this deep, you're not going to be utilizing a lot of water because it's gonna hold the water, right? Brooklyn Bridge Park, this is a 45 degree slope. Hmm? This is extreme horticulture. You need to have root depth in this situation. Now, this is the difference between a sand-based soil and a silt and clay-based soil. So we had the opportunity that there was a different soil scientist on this early portion, and these two were next to each other. One was done the other way. Now, if you look at that, the sand incorporated into that. Look at the difference within three months. This is how they established. So these are the things we have to look at. Once we've done an, uh, uh, an amendment, let's look and see how it works and make our decision properly. So we've done a number of different uh, applications in terms of that. Chicago Botanic Garden. They were about to install a garden here, and Fred Spicer, who had just started there, said, T, could you look at this just before you go? We're about to install the soil. And I said, stop. Took about a month later, he stopped it. We got into it because this, did, this had just been installed 10 months before. And look at the water ponding. This is an area which kids are supposed to play. And it wasn't draining at all. Now, we got in there, we used a parking lot, we mixed all the soil components, brought this in, created a drainage system, brought in a sand layer so that this would function, put it in, and this is the final result. And it has functioned absolutely, and this is our root development now. Here you've got about a 10 inch root development. Now this is what's gonna keep things going. Dumbarton Oaks is a project we just got back from and we've been working on. All the Carpinus, out of the 72 initial Carpinus, only 40 were left. Now these were planted in uh, the 1960s. You would think this should have survived. So you could have pushed them over. When we dug them up, there was almost no root development. We brought in our soils because of such a tight space. We brought them in in big bags. So you can see our soils being brought in. We mixed it right down on site. We covered this whole area in the middle. And you can see here, here are the old trees being taken out. Look at the root development on a 60-year-old tree. There's nothing there. So we dug these out, created a, a runnel, basically a bathtub, did a... Um, percolation test in the middle, filled it with sand in order so that it would not fill up with water, and then here's our uh, soil component going in, which has the same sand in it, so if you go back to our initial uh, picture, you'll see what we did there, and this is the, the project in place. Um, so, and Storm King, we were brought in to bring back the natural LA, and uh, in the same case, they had spent many, many years removing all the leaves. So all the nutrient cycling capacity was gone. But all the leaves were across the street, and we were able to bring those leaves back and utilize that to create more compost. We brought another compost to do liquid biological amendments and uh, create a whole space to bring certain alleys back and plant new trees make sure that they would function properly. Now, it's not just based on this, on this hemisphere, but they've had issues. We're dealing with the whole issue of Cholinectria pseudovaniculata. You may have heard about this, the boxwood blight. We are working uh, very heavily with the Royal Horticultural Society on this, and it's a very interesting uh, 
project, which Andrea will be speaking about more tomorrow, but in terms of dealing with a very serious disease, and our whole focus is on dealing with it organically through soil management. Um, this is Joel Cotin, who's the director, or he's the head of gardening, head gardener for um, uh, Versailles. And so we're working on a number of different levels to try to come up with a solution to this. This is our farm in New Jersey where we do most of our research these days. So we do it there and we're sort of taking that model of doing best practices and exporting it to uh, the industry as best as we can. And hopefully we can come up with a means of having architecture and nature work together. Thank you.